This is James Taylor, and you're listening to The Creative Life. The Creative Life podcast is a show created for you, the creative. If you're looking for inspiration, motivation, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's a musician, writer, artist, designer, performer, educator, or creative entrepreneur. They share their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, their insights, and much, much more. In this episode, I talk to scientist and technologist Tanzim Chowdhury. We talk about girls and technology, the importance of breaking things, having a creative approach to solving problems, and the incredible work that she's doing around technology and mental health. Enjoy the episode. Hey, it's James Taylor, and I'm delighted today to have Tanzim Chowdhury, and she is Associate Professor of Information Science at Cornell University. At Cornell, she directs the People Aware Computing Group, which develops applications that improve people's well-being. Part of this work is changing the way mental health is diagnosed and treated by creating new and novel, novel wearable and mobile apps and devices. As part of her doctoral thesis at MIT, she created the Sociometer and the first experiments which led to a new field called reality mining, an area of science that Technology Review magazine declared as one of the 10 technologies most likely to change the way we live. She is also an entrepreneur and has recently co-founded Health Rhythm, and we're going to get into talking about her her life as an entrepreneur as well as a, a scientist and academic. So welcome to the show, Tanzine. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So share with our, our listeners what's going on in your world, what are your current projects? So my, my current projects um, are quite diverse. I work in um, designing and developing mobile technologies that can uh, measure, as you mentioned, human well-being, and also actively working on how you can influence human behavior to increase quality of life. So that involves both designing new um, sensing technology that can have a better understanding and better ways of capturing behavior, um, analysis of the data that we gather to um, extract meaningful information. So we look at sensors that can measure human voice we, uh, and characterize the human voice, sensors that can unobtrusively me- measure sleep, um, sensors that are also looking at the food, uh, the food that you eat. And, and ultimately, we're also interested in taking these measurements, analyzing it, and being able to build actuation um, systems that can uh, ultimately influence the behavior to improve our our well-being. And and where did it all start for you, going going right back? When did you kind of get the the science bug or the the technology bug? Take us right back and then just talk to us about how, how that developed and to the point where you are now in your career. Yeah, so it's it's kind of interesting because when I um, was growing up, I was always interested in in science and math, but I had no exposure to technology. I I grew up in Bangladesh, and when I was growing up, there was no computer education. I I never owned a computer. I never even touched a computer till I came to the United States for my undergraduate studies. So it was kind of uh, interesting how I uh, how I uh, um, got attracted to more on the technology side. And and what really interested me in in kind of the the technology, it was um, science has always been very fascinating and it it really helps you understand the world. It helps you quantify the world. And um, but technology in some ways makes it real. You build things to really get concrete information and you can really influence people and have an impact on people's life. And that always um, fascinated me. And and more so from the perspective of how humans and, uh, can use the technology for better understanding themselves. And and ultimately that led to kind of uh, my interest in, in health to better improve their health. So it it's, it's, always been what you can do and the potential applications of technology that drew me um, to that area and because you could really build something and make it real and really take science to people's hands. 
When you're talking at you know an early age, you're not having access to really computers as well, but that changed obviously when when you came to to the US. I'm interested also to is it maybe a slight divergence on, on this, but you know if if I go into um, the law faculties at top universities now, it's often seventy percent or sixty seventy percent female. If I go into some of the big media companies, if I go to the BBC in London, it's probably sixty seventy percent female. Yeah, it always feels that if you go into faculties of science, or maybe maybe it's just in terms of what I, I can see in terms of in the in the media, it's still and certainly technology and startup culture. It seems very male orientated. Mm-hmm. What what's your take on how we can actually maybe get get more women in and girls into the sciences and and technology? Yeah, that's uh, that's a good kind of question, and it's definitely true that science, uh, particularly um, if we look from undergraduate to graduate to faculty and and kind of sticking in technology career, um, the female percentage keeps on shrinking. And I think there there are multiple factors um, of that influence that one starts very early on in terms of the the perceptions that we create the just uh, I think the roots are from very early on the 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 books we read the toys we play with right and there is so much kind of gender segregation and types of play we encourage and even uh, I think uh, Part of technology is trying something, building something, breaking, fixing it, and iterating. And even from an early age, I think um, there is more of that uh, that is encouraged uh, in boys than girls. So I think that the fixing has to start very early on. Um, but uh, in in kind of my where I come in, I teach at a university. I think one of the things um, which is changing now, uh, I feel for for the better, is um, techno- particularly in computer science and, and technology, it's it's not just here learn programming or here 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 some of the algorithms that you have to um, learn how to implement, but it's actively tr- tied to um, solving problems and solving problems in in the real world, and which I think often. Um, attracts uh, more diverse audiences who are interested, who come from different backgrounds and really interested in understanding how how what they're studying and, and their work is going to impact the world more broadly, uh, which I think with where computer science is going and technology is going is, is a great time because it has penetrated in every discipline and everything we do it's it's in our houses it's in our personal lives so um i think from that perspective of how we teach technology has to be really tied to what technology can do and i think it does help um, broaden that reach but i think fundamentally it has to start much much earlier on in terms of how we kind of educate and 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 kind of bring up uh genders because um some of these characters although they're not kind of technology centered but ultimately does impact um how you learn to be a technologist and and evolve and um build things over iteratively uh or to to really kind of encourage that problem solving and also risk taking and and Building things through through iteration and failure that's important. But you you, you also mentioned right at the start there, also being fine about breaking things. Yeah, as well as well you know that, that kind of the problem solving and trying to put things together together and see how see how they how they work. I think will be interesting for a lot of our listeners. You know, I know a lot of our listeners come from maybe the creative arts, they're musicians, they're writers, and so often when they approach a, a creative challenge, it's about they don't think about necessarily in terms of pro- solving a problem necessarily. They're thinking about they maybe have an idea for something, um, but the in some way they, they they are actually solving a problem, whether it's a lyric, lyrical problem as a songwriter or it's a, a script thing for for um, uh, for a novelist, for example. Can you talk to me about when when you work with your with your your students? How do you teach them to approach the the, the I suppose the, the innovative process, the, the the creative process, taking something from you? You have a problem. Maybe you 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 have a, a, an idea of a problem that you want to solve. To actually, what what are some of the stages that from from a an from a scientist background they would normally think about in terms of tackling that problem? 
So one of uh, the things that I try to encourage is um, who who are you solving the problem for? And I think um, sometimes from the technology side, the limitation is that we we t- think about technology exclusively and often remove the users and the humans. And I think one of the things that is um, really um critical is to think about who you're solving the problem for and and what are what are some of the some of the expectations and assumptions that you can make make there so to try to really um, take a problem and and define it in terms of the assumptions that you can make the constraints that you need to put because that that kind of um, tells you a space of solutions that you can explore and the other thing is to um, really think broadly in terms of solution um, from different disciplines. So a, a lot of the work that I've, um, I do in my, my personal research and how I, 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 I try to kind of teach my students is um, technology does not live in isolation. And, it's, and especially now when we think about technology and human, it's, it's how humans react to the technology and how it helps them kind of blend into the real world. It it really brings in ideas from what we know about um, psychology, sociology, um, the the environment and technology together. So that's that's another thing that I try to bring kind of bring to bear as I think about problem solving is what define the Define the problem, constrain the problem space that you're trying to build a solution. What ideas it can, both from technology and other, can hint at the right solution. And then kind of go down to um, thinking about designing technology that that fits all those constraints. So I think um, often not just being confined in, in the technology space. And and finally is how are how are you going to quantify um, the the success, I think, from when we are talking about technology, it's important to really have some form of metric of evaluating um, success that something is working. And I think that's that's something that's different from from sometimes the other creative kind of processes. In the end, you have to take all these ideas and boil it down to how how are you going to measure the success and impact of that technology and i um and and that's not always in terms of how accurate you are it might be in terms of adoption of users it might be in terms of actually do you um improve a person's um uh, quality of life how do you characterize that so tying all those two th- things um and and designing a solution is is critical so it almost sounds a little bit similar to industrial design the way design thinking works where you have you're thinking first and foremost very much about the 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 kind of end user but you you have a a quantitative way of of looking at these whether something you know defining what does success look like as well at the end of it so you're you're approaching it in more similar to the way a, a design industrial designer would approach a problem rather than maybe a, a musician or a writer would approach a problem yeah i think that's 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 true and i think one of the things to keep in mind that when you are thinking uh working with users or thinking about the end users is there there are certain um constraints that um, understanding what are some of the the constraints on the user side or concerns from the user side, and where you could push the boundary. So I'll I'll kind of give an example. It might be we we have mobile devices. There are lots and lots of sensors. Now one issue that always comes up is privacy, right? So where where is the boundary of privacy for the user, and what is the need? for a solution if it's health, like if it be someone with dep- uh, someone tackling depression or an older adult trying to live um, independently at home, they, they might have different trade-offs of privacy. So how can you kind of push the technology beyond what they could have imagined, but also know what are some of the, the, the concerns that you have to respect in building a solution so it's it's really kind of thinking about the uh, both sides that you're trying to advance the technology and really introduce new things but you have to understand 
which kind of what's the space that it needs to live in to really get adopted and used. It sounds like it reminds me a little bit of a previous a podcast guest we had on called Karen El Elazari, who works at uh, the University of Tel Aviv, who is involved in um, in, in hacking actually and biohacking, which I which, and she was talking about how now, especially with with devices, um, in, you know, in, in terms of implanted devices in people, heart rate things and 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 uh, and different things around there, and also the devices that people are carrying all the time, which are tracking all this data and pulling all this data in how easy it is now to to hack these things and it's a yeah, whole yeah. new level of security and privacy that has to come into that exactly exactly and i think there are there are different uh constraints or different um, concerns, as I said, for the different user group and older adults who uh, might be willing to sacrifice some uh, more privacy if they get enough benefit to live independently at home um, for someone who is um, struggling with mental health issues. They m might be willing to um, collect information, but uh, they don't want to share it publicly. Um, there might be certain uh, said about um, it's it's fine to um, collect my location data, the places I visit, but I don't want to actually disclose where my home is. Yeah. Right. So there are there are different ways of um, taking this notion of privacy that like, a user. Uh, has and how do you translate it into a technology solution and and that's something that we have to solve right that where where is the core concern and how can you design technology that can take into account the core concern but still uh, provide a solution that's um, useful and and um, can help and can be innovative and push the boundary and from an outsider's perspective it always seems that the science the sciences and technology are much more um, comfortable with the idea of failure, of make of, run, of running tests and failing, and then finding what's not working and, and, and changing. Maybe where, so let's say, within business, um, there's uh, there can be a, a certain reticence, especially in some countries and cultures, mm -hmm. to 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 have any, be seen to be failing in any kind of way. Um, can you talk to to us about a time when you were you specifically worked on a project and you gave it your your everything, you gave it your heart and your soul, but for whatever reason. It just didn't work out necessarily like you'd hoped. And more importantly, what were the lessons that you took away from that that experience? So I think uh, pretty much uh, everything I worked on didn't work in the uh, in the beginning. Uh, so I think my PhD um, thesis is a is a good example. So I worked on a solution um, that uh, looked at analyzing face-to-face -face conversation, collecting um, voice data and um, in noisy environment and from that um, figuring out whether we can, how, how people form social networks and also uh, looking at who, who are the people who are more influential in a network, which is in an organizational behavior, has also implication in terms of who are, who are the kind of key gatekeepers. But um, I, at that point, I didn't, I didn't really think through um, uh, some of the things that I just mentioned in terms of what will it take for this technology to really get adopted in organization in people's life, starting from the form factor of the solution to where the data is processed and where it resides and, and what it is for the user. So um, in, in that case, like if you're sharing data with the uh, with an organization, yes, sure, the organization has um, an incentive and, and benefit, but the end user, you're basically kind of, they're giving up their privacy for nothing. We maybe potentially risk at their kind of career risk because now the organization is tracking more behavior um, to, to, is it is it something that they're going to it will identify themselves as they're carrying around and 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 collecting data that might be um, sensitive to others around them as well. So those are some of the kind of things that when I um, looked at at that problem that there was a technical solution, but it really didn't kind of address the issues of. Um, what will make people use that? And, and that's something that I still kind of struggle with. And it's one of the ways to, I've um, tackled that, is you really need to embed yourself into the users um, and what their concerns are and how they see their own benefit. And, and really it's, 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 it's kind of 
uh, the use of the technology, both at an individual and at a collective level, there has to be a uh, benefit there. So I think um, that was the kind of biggest lesson in terms of, uh, for me, is that how you can't just think of a technology solution in isolation. And as you design it, it needs to be tested with the users that you have in mind and learn from them. And oftentimes that brings up new research challenges that you have to solve and, and iterate. So um, that's, that's something that I even now, um, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge that you have to actively work on in, in order to um, get make real impact with the technology. And that's definitely true in the space that I currently work on quite a bit in, in mental health, right? There's stigma associated with it. Um, there is, uh, and if you're doing it in work environment, but there is also real bene benefit of improving someone's life and how do you balance those and how do you even give that information back to the user, right? So if someone is um, depressed or have mental health problem, there are there are risks associated to give give uh, feedback. Often there is increased risk of, of suicide or decline. So you really need to understand the nuances of how do you uh, provide feedback, engage the users and provide benefit both from the clinical side and also the patient side to design a solution. Because because one obviously one of the areas that you specialize in is identifying voice patterns for health. And so I, I'm immediately thinking of like, for example, insurance companies, if someone calls up an insurance company, most of the time they're recording or many times they're recording those conversations and they, they're often passing them through uh, technologies to kind of see if someone's lying or not or little patterns they're looking for. So those, you know, the, the, those technologies that would allow someone to analyze a voice pattern could also say, you know, is this person at risk from something? Are they having a some? You know, is a, is a men, men, forms of mental illness kind of coming through there? You talked on your TED talk about how, especially people that are close to someone, they can they can just notice just from the the gait that someone's mm -hmm. walking how there's some there's something a little bit off as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so th they're also some of the things that we do is that we are continuously analyzing uh, voice patterns, but the actual data is never leaving their phone. Right. So um, this uh, giving the assurance that um, what how that data could be used is is somewhat constrained with uh, given what they consented to has been very important, right? So even there is this kind of trade of do you collect the data and send it um, to the cloud and do some processing and, and whether you do the processing on the mobile device itself um, and with certain kind of encryption and technologically they, they might have the similar outcomes, but in terms of the perception in an individual mind, it's it's different. So kind of thinking about what will get adopted is is important. And so we we've made certain design choices in how to build a solution based on our interactions with users quite um, extensively. So you could, in theory, with something like this, let's say, I'm, and I'm I'm imagining some of the singers that are listening at the, to this episode thinking, well, I I wonder if they can tell from when someone's singing what their 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 mental state is as well you know we so you're talking about often when people are when people are talking there's voice patterns that are going on there that that are maybe showing signals for certain things is it just a spoken word or would it work for when someone is singing as well a oh, good question so we haven't done any experiments with singing but some of the things that we've seen in terms of voice pattern that um, you notice when there is a change in the mental health state is um when someone is depressed, as, I, as you mentioned, the gait changes, but also speaking rate changes. So uh, that's been observed that uh, individuals who have uh, suffering from depression have this kind of phenomena called psychomotor retardation, which basically means they slow down. And you can see that in the slowing of their um, gait or walking rate, but you see that in slowing of their speaking rate as well. Um, there is less inflection in their voice, so that it's much more of a monotone. Mm. Um, so by combining all these, you can see a person who generally is quite engaged and animated Kind of losing that and trending towards speaking less, speaking slower, speaking more in a monotone. So 
there might be some of those patterns in, in a way a person characteristically sings to when if they're uh, having a change in their um, mood or um, suffering from depression. We haven't done that experiment, but possibly you might see those changes as well. And what about for yourself when when you're working on a difficult project or, or a problem and you just kind of get stuck on it? What, what do you do personally in order to um, give yourself some perspective and uh, and kind of find that inspiration, find a, a new way of looking at things? Do you do you do you kind of go into a different environment or do you and do you just kind of get away from it? What, what are some of the, the, the strategies that you have used for yourself? So for me, that what has worked very well is talking to people. And I think, um, although I'm a technologist, I've gotten a lot of kind of inspiration ideas or thinking about solving problems through talking to people from very different kind of discipline as uh, my work naturally uh, kind of uh, brings me into collaboration with psychiatrists, doctors, psychologists, sociologists. So I often find just... Um, getting out of my world and, and really um, talking about my problem to different people can, can be really, um, really that kind of breaks the kind of gridlock in my head um, to try to kind of approach it from different angles and, and then kind of bring in my expertise from the technical side to see how, how they can blend and mesh together. And in this journey, in this career journey that you've had as well, can you point to any times where you've had, uh, and I know it's, it, it, it can sound, um, it's a very overused phrase as well, but that light bulb moment, that moment of insight where something's just clicked and you've said, ah, okay, this is maybe the direction I need to go with this research or, or this is, a, this is a, a, something new that I need to put into this, this thing I'm working on. So uh, I would say one of the, one of the, uh, periods where uh, kind of where that light bulb went uh, uh, kind of went on was when I actually first started working on uh, mental health. So I was working on on technology for um, tracking uh, behaviors and people's people's states, looking at voice patterns. But um, really, there's so many, so many uses for that and different different kind of almost benefits or different ways of characterizing the solution that it's, it's really hard sometimes um, at least for was for me to think about how, how is all this I'm working on really going to make a difference or what's the, what, wh- where is the real kind of potential for making, making an impact. And, and that's, that's when um uh, where I was, I was talking to different folks in different disciplines. Where realizing that um, in the space of mental health, the the ways that technology has penetrated other areas of medicine hadn't, and and pretty much all the diagnosis and understanding that's done is using. Uh, patient's self-report or understanding patient's behavior in the real world, which the doctor only gets through an indirect interaction, doesn't observe the patient in the real world. Um, so uh, that that was really kind of a, 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 a big realization that a lot of what I'm working on can be really directly applied and also not just applied, but um, there are ways of measuring how much do we help, right? So someone, do you help them better recover from depression? Um, is their rate of improvement or uh, admission quicker? Do you have someone help prevent someone going into relapse to even the cost um, savings? So really kind of, for me, it was important to think about how all these technology could be used to make an impact and and what was the right domain to focus on was a was a big kind of moment to kind of think that really this fits and not only does it fit you can actually um really show how how much you can help which is often a often a a kind of a challenging problem because you can help a little bit and you don't know if it matters that much or not but kind of making that connection was was um was very helpful for me. And so, so are we now getting to a point where your your family doctor will be um, will be pinged with a message if your 
certain patterns are, be, are showing because of the, the, the apps and the things that you're carrying with you are showing, oh, something's not quite right here. And then the, 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 the doctor's then coming back to you saying, Listen, I, think, I think we should have you in or I think maybe we should look at your, yep. your medication. Yep, exactly right. And that's, that's the kind of vision that we're working towards. And I think um, that uh, at the same time, if we look at technology and there's a lot of wearables and fitness technology out there, um, there's still a kind of gap between clinical adoption and customer use, right? Pretty much everyone wears some kind of tracking device, but is it used for the care of the patient and health of the patient? And there's still uh, a gap. And I think one of the things that um, was useful for me, especially in the mental health space, because individuals are not often best at managing that, um, to think, how do you really bring it to the user, connect it to the clinical system, and and measure, and for, for a doctor to use it, they have to be able to measure that benefit. Um, so that that's just not just a kind of technology solution in isolation, but it's it's how the technology solution connects what are the hooks to the other areas that are involved and into the person's life that was that was uh, a big kind of um change in the way i was thinking about kind of uh from just the purely technology perspective and i, and I suppose as we as more and more governments talk around this idea of, of gross national happiness so i think yep. it started in nepal and obviously it's very big here in the uk and it's, it's, it's spreading in other, other places now uh with everyone having this before it was very very difficult to say well what is what is happiness for a start um and maybe if we, if we define it a bit more in terms of uh, well-being and mental health um, there's going to be soon data and um, and the, the, the people that are looking at this data can say, actually, w- what we're finding here is why is there little peaks here? Why is there little troughs <laughs> going on here amongst our different communities? Why, why have we got uh, red spots in this particular community? What's going on in, in those areas? No, absolutely right. And also, I think it's important to relate it to other aspects of our lives, right? So um, happiness or even mental health is not an isolated problem. If we are struggling with mental health problem, it affects how our relationship, it affects our work, career, performance. It also affects our physical health, right? So there is a big relationship with how uh, people who have diabetes or uh, cardiac illness, um, those who have mental health problems, the outcomes are worse. So I think one of the other thing that we need to do is, um, and the technology will enable us to do, is study that and 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 then also help design interventions and solution that helps us overall, right? Um, and we think about that particularly in young population who often think that um, the kind of physical health is great, they don't think about their mental health. But if you relate it to um, the impact of this uh, physical and mental health to outcomes that they do care about, it could be their social life, it could be their academic performance, I think we can do a better job of de- designing technology that can also help improve behavior. Uh, because otherwise, it, it becomes a challenge that um, we all think that we're going to exercise more or we're going to take better care of ourselves, but it, it needs to be hooked to something that really gets us going. And especially now, I think it's, I think it's males under 25 now in the West. I think the biggest killer is suicide now as well. So yep. this early, yep. early detection ways, you know, you've got, you could save many people a part of a generation. So as we start to finish up here, uh, Tanzim, um, I have to ask you, do you have any online resources or tools or apps that you absolutely love? Um, online resources, tools, or apps. So, um, w- being kind of someone building these uh, technologies, I'm also, I think, the biggest critics uh, of the technology. So, I do collect a lot of um, data about myself using smartwatches or phones. I'm continuously collecting um, data, and I think there are a lot of lot of great. Um, wearables now and apps that are out there but one of the things that frustrate me is often I never act on that data or I never look at that data mm-hmm. and and that's I think one thing that drives me in my research is how do we really connect um, all these great apps that um, that and and wearables that are out there to really kind of get us to act on that data because I don't think it's it's there yet 
But other than that, as as an academic and 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 someone, um, I couldn't I couldn't live without my um, uh, smartphone and and my emails and calendars. So in the end, some of the things that I end up using are pretty boring and generic. <laughs> And and do you when when you think about these these dashboards now that are maybe available that are pulling in different data? Obviously, there's on the fitness side, there's like Map My Fitness, and there's a, the Apple's Health. Is, is there any one that you would say is it's not there yet, but it actually shows signs of promise that people maybe should check out if they're interested in this area? I think um, if we look at uh, depending on what area you're interested in, um, if you're interested in physical kind of fitness, right? The, the there are the Apple um, platform. The, the smartphones are easy. Both um, Apple and kind of Android devices have platform for food. There is My Fitness Pal. Um, there there are a bunch of like yeah, mood related um, apps. There is a, a company called Affectiva that that's doing some great work. So it depends on what you're interested in, but there are, I think, a lot of lot of interesting application. I wouldn't kind of highlight anything that uh, I think is um, my personal favorite. I think it really depends on kind of individual preferences and lifestyle and what, what fits into that. So I'm not going to kind of <laughs> mix one. And, and if you could recommend just one book and one record, one bit of music to our listeners, what would they be? One book and one record. Um, one of my so I, I listen to a lot of um, audiobooks, um, and one of the reasons. So a lot of this. <clears throat> so in psychology, people say there is recency bias. So I have recency bias. Um, but one of my favorite books is called Far from the Tree uh, by Andrew Solomon. It's about when uh, you have kids who are very different from you. And this is from a psychology perspective, health perspective. It was fascinating. And I think it gave me also ideas of how do you design technology for very different people. Um, so that uh, that would be uh, my... Uh, uh, favorite and I think in terms of music see I'm, I'm so like not up to date into kind of recent music uh, but one of my favorite musician and I pretty much like a lot of his um, albums is um, one of the Indian subcontinent um, drummer tabla player called Zakir Hussain so um, so he's probably the the his albums are the ones that I, I kind of end up listening to the most. Great. And we'll put all these down in the show notes. People go to jamestaylor.me and just type in Tanzine. You'll be able to see all the links to all these as well. Um, finally, let's imagine if you woke up tomorrow morning and had to start from scratch. So I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest that if you want to do the kind of work you, you're doing now, and let's imagine if you're a, a 14 or a 15 or a 16-year-old girl who is interested in the kind of things that you're talking about just now, What's the best way for them to get get involved in this world? How what's the is there is there a path that they should maybe be looking towards? I think it's there's so many kind of um, new tools and communities um, that are available now that wasn't there. So I think there are big maker communities um, that are not part of just kind of the school system, which are which are a great way to get involved in, in technology, right? So that's that's one thing that I would encourage. There's so many online resources and there are also um, tools that make it make it easy for someone to get a novice to get started and without really having expertise going to an expert physically to to learn that right so if you look at from um uh, hardware things like raspberry pi or stuff that's coming from adafruit technologies to um resources on the web to actually these um spontaneous communities of interest particularly the maker movement i think uh, provides uh, provides a lot of tools resources and 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 support that makes it uh easier for uh, individuals to just get um, involved based on their interests. And I also think that's particularly useful when it comes to um, uh, young girls, because I think what we need to kind of break, there are a lot of, lot of the kind of structural biases that are already there in our educational system. Well, Tanzi, thank you so much for coming on the show. What is the best way for people to, con- to connect with you and find out more about your, your research and the work you're, you're undertaking just now? 
So the best way, so as go to uh, send me an email. It's tanzim.chaudhry at cornell.edu. My research group webpage, um, which you can also link, which is People Aware Computing Group at Cornell. My um, and then my Twitter handle is uh, tanzimc, and also my um, group's Twitter handle is at pac People Aware Computing underscore Cornell. So any of these a good way to see what's going on. Great. And we'll put all these on the show notes as well. Tanzim, thank you so much. I wish you all the best in your, your future work and research. I'm sure there's going to be many, many interesting technologies and things coming out of, uh, of Cornell and the, and the group that you're working with just now. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you, James. Thanks for having me. Hey, James Taylor here again. And if you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high-performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.